Welcome to M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. From interviews with the leading figures in the industry, to coffee chats with analysts, diversity panels, all the way through to workshops, we'll be covering it all. We do hope you enjoy the video and please give us a like and a follow on our social media. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and welcome to our first episode of the M&A Monday series where we will be delving into the investment banking series uh, by talking to professionals in the industry uh, from all levels, from the analyst level all the way up to the senior managing director uh, level. I'm Yash, the founder and co-head of the UCL M&A group and I'm joined today by Nicola, an analyst at the group and also an events ex executive. We're delighted together to welcome our first ever uh, guest on the series, Matthew Ponsonby, at the head of global banking at BM Paribas, um, where we'll be kind of discussing his different aspects of his career, uh, as well as tips to succeed in the industry. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Uh, hi, Matthew. How are hi you there. doing? Very nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you as well. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. And I guess if we get straight into it, the first kind of question which I had was looking at your vast, uh, expansive career, what really stood out to me initially was a unique degree that you did. Uh, I saw that you did material sciences and metallurgy. And so my question was, uh, what made you make that initial switch from a STEM based degree to uh, the finance industry? and did you have any challenges along the way? Uh, and what would be your adv advice for STEM students who are looking to follow the same path into the investment banking industry? Perfect, good place to start. So look, actually, um, there, are a lot of, uh, there, are, there are an awful lot of people in this industry who come from, from, a, from a STEM background, because it's not, which is slightly intuitive, because if you have a facility with numbers, that's a, you know, it's a natural route into to, to, to investment banking. And most STEM students are, you know, fundamentally there's a maths based element to, 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 to the degree. So, um, no, I, I uh, so I, as I said, I did a pure, pure science degree and actually, and I've done some research. So I worked at the National Bureau of Standards in Washington for a bit um, and was thinking about a more, more engineering based uh, career. Um, and I went to a few interviews with some engineering firms back in the, in, in the mid 80s. And um, the world was quite different then. And so, you know, you go through the interview and you ask the normal question, they ask you the normal question, where do you see yourself in, in 10 years time or 20 years time? And being, you know, like you guys, like young and ambitious, I would sort of answer, well, I'd you know, like to think that if all went well and I'd really done well, I'd be, you know, I could have a, have a leadership position in the firm. And that sort of answer, you try and be ambitious, but not too cocky about it. And they would all look at me and go, hmm, yeah. well, look, I've been here 30 years and I'm a plant manager and I, would, you know, they, they, there was very little ambition at the time for <clears throat> that I could see to take uh, that to, to the roles I was starting in and have an aspiration to to have a sort of influence on the companies you were joining. And it may have been the specific seats I was looking at, it may have been the firms I was talking to, but in contrast, um, I actually, as, as you know, when I went into consulting, into the more finance, and it was, but I went into the sort of a more finance end of the consulting industry, though, though, though those careers were pretty defined that you were joining as a junior, but you know, they were, they were recruiting future managing directors or future partners of the firm. And that idea of, of having a, 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 an ability to, to make a difference early on, but also have a have real progression through my career was very attractive so for me it was that the the engineering piece was less attractive um now times moved on a lot and you know mr musk would disagree with me profoundly as to where the where, where the, the more exciting end of the world to work is but you know at the time it was a it, and i think still um consulting and then in investment banking was it was a very exciting place to work um, and certainly it's it is it is a very natural routine from any science-based degree in, in, into banking um, 
And, and actually one of the things I'd like to quite like to emphasize is as, as an industry, we probably got overly focused on where we were recruiting from. So in, you know, 10, uh, early, early 2000s, slightly following uh, a lead from, from, from the US, the industry grew, grew more and more focused on, on finance-based um, graduates. And that has actually some quite interesting diversity implications. And, and when I say diversity, I mean diversity of thought, because fundamentally, if you're on a finance based degree, irrespective of your gender, your, 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 your country of origin, your, your ethnic background, your, the way you think, the way you've been taught and the, and the way you, and, and, and your what interests you is actually quite can be quite aligned because you're all coming together to do a very similar degree with a, from a similar background, you know, from a, with, with similar reasoning. And, and actually, it's been a focus of mine in graduate recruitment over the, over the last few years to drive a great, greater diversity in, in terms of degree courses, because actually that brings a greater diversity of thinking. It also, uh, as a side, you know, in addition, brings a, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's helpful you know, we have a mandated 50-50 gender diversity for, 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 for the um, graduate program here. Um, and, and I think, but for me, the diversity of thinking is very important because fundamentally when you're joining investment banking, certainly the, the, the corporates, you know, the, the, the non-market side, so the, the, the issuer side, private side that I'm in, which I can talk about a bit in a minute, that, that is, you know, you, you start off with a very high numerical focus to your to, to what you do but but fundamentally you're going to succeed based on your your soft so your eq as much as your iq it's all about getting on with people it's building trust it's being able to communicate and therefore um you need to have a you need you know the the most successful bankers tend to be those who who both have a facility with numbers but also a facility with people and that actually turns out that it's not necessarily someone who's just Done a finance degree, can yeah. be, but not, but not, not, not exclusively. So, no, I, I'm very, I'm very keen to promote this industry to anyone, irrespective. When I started, it was a bit. I mean, I have colleagues who started who've done history, who've done music, who, who had a very broad group of degrees, and that's what I want to get back to. I don't. It should be as long as you have the facility, you know, basic facility with numbers, and this is not rocket science. Um, you, you you should be very thoughtful you know you should be happy to think about this industry yeah that's fantastic and i think positive news for everyone who is studying a diverse range of subjects at university that this is a really good career path to explore yeah and i think that leads me on very nicely to my next question when you spoke about uh, your early careers in consulting and you worked at a firm which we now know as essentia what made you make that shift from consulting to investment banking? What are some of the key differences that you found? Okay, well, the industry was very different then. So investment banks mm -hmm. didn't really, we recruited our first graduates at Morgan Grenfell, which was the first bank I started three years after I started. So the industry was really, the, the classical route into the industry at the time was to you qualified as an accountant, and then as a qualified accountant, you moved into, you moved into banking as a junior. Um, so you had a sort of basic financial gr grounding. I, I, I uh, looked at, you know, I looked at doing accountancy and I looked at um, uh, Accenture was at that time part of, it was, a, it was part of Anderson, uh, Arthur Anderson, which was one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, and they had a consulting arm and, a, and, a, and an and a accounting arm. And um, I interviewed for all of them. And if I'm brutally honest, the, the pay at the consulting arm was considerably better at the accounting arm. <laughs> and they sold a good story and I, you know, and, and I, and I took it. But I, I was looking at, a, a, with, a, with a view to going on to banking, and I hadn't really, you know, particularly thought it through, but the consulting piece um, was different. They paid a bit more and, and it enabled a bit more variety and I didn't have to do any more exams, all of which were very appealing. So I went into the consulting arm, which is, which, as you say, now Accenture, um, and had a very entertaining three years. But I'd always intended to, to look at banking. And so at the three years in, which was roughly the time I'd have, um, at roughly the time I'd have qualified as an accountant, I then applied to the banks along with my peer group who were, who were the qualified accountants. And, and indeed, some qualified solicitors, went, or lawyers went in for that as well. Right. You know. Yeah, brilliant. Um, now, uh, 
you have been involved, uh, you have played a major role over the course of your career in over 350 billion worth of transactions. And out of all these transactions, uh, which one particularly stand out to you? And can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, so, so I think it's always that obviously the, the first deals you're really involved with stick in your mind. So one of the first deals I, I was involved in was selling um, a shoe business from one private equity firm to another. And um, I, we had done the information memorandum and the, it was down to the, you know, we'd gone through a round of bidders. We had one bit, one, one bidder left. My, um, and I was a, I, you know, I, I was an, a, a young associate, um, first year associate, and my VP had gone away on holiday and it was down to the final negotiations. And um, I went to the, you know, the closing negotiations overnight. It was just me. I was the only representative from the bank and it was me with my client and, and, the, and, and a sponsor on the other side who I still you know, I still see, and in fact, is an investor in, 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 in businesses I know. Um, and that was a hugely, a, a, a hugely interesting, it was a piece sort of, I can remember it cl clearly in my mind now, just before I left, we were going, leave, going across to, to the lawyers at about seven o'clock in the evening. And I was there on my own in the office, sort of thinking to myself, right, I can do this, I can do this, and getting my papers together pulling myself together to go make the walk across, walk in confident, this is it, I'm negotiating on behalf of my client here. Um, and I, I, I can see myself doing that right now. And that was 30 odd years ago. And it's crystal clear in my mind, tiny deal. I, I think the total value of the company was probably about 90 million, um, but it sticks really, really firmly in my mind. Um, then what else? Um, selling, um, watches of Switzerland when it was sold the first time by by what was then called the Ratner Group and you should look up Gerald Ratner he was a flamboyant character and he and his CFO used to ride to meetings on matching Harley Davidson's him just ahead and the other one and the finance director just behind um going around with them to sell that business was that that there's a lot of anecdotes from that but the two of them pulling out on the on the from the street on the two Harleys and I'll be trading behind in the cab would be that that <laughs> <laughs> that was that that was very entertaining um floating the halifax which was there was a big range of uh bit of the the, the old building started the floated in the sort of 2000s uh we had to it, the halifax the building sites were mutually owned so they were owned by their members so when they were floated the documentation had to go to all the members the halifax was the largest and we had to work out the logistics of when we could print the prospectus because there wouldn't be enough paper available in the UK to print the prospectus and you had to fit it in between the publishing times of the the glossy magazines so if Vogue and you know the the the, the paper magazines because if you were on the same time cycle as the print magazines they obviously print every month so the paper was reserved for them and then we had to work out how there was a health and safety issue as to how many of these prospectuses the postman could carry or the post person could carry to deliver them through the letterbox so we had to work out what was the you know there was a min maximum weight of the prospectus because there's you know great weighty documents because the post the, the delivery service would be hand delivering these and on one day and they could only carry so many in their bags so there was some really weird logistical stuff going through that up off top of all the other things so that i remember um it, it's it turns it's it you know the, the extraordinary thing about this is as a as a as, an, as a business is that you can do you know so i'm i'm an MA professional you know by background that's what i've done although i the last 10 years have been more in management roles um and, and that it sounds like i've been doing the same thing but the reality is you can see from those three anecdotes completely different right so sectors different or or situation different er, the variety that you get through your career in, in, in this business is, is extraordinary. It really is, and it, it's endlessly fascinating. Everyone, because you, we are the ultimate, M&A bankers are the ultimate generalists, you're pulling together, synthesizing information from the legal side, from the accounting side, the numbers, the industry, pulling it all together to, to, to work with your client in negotiating the best possible transaction for them. You're doing all that and you're not the lawyer and you're not the accountant and you're not the 
um, you know, the, the consultant who, who, who can drive the, the, the airline statistic. But you synthesize all that in a way to provide um, contextualized advice based on the other deals you've been involved in, based on what you know, and, and everyone's different. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating industry. Thank you for that great overview and the end, and especially the first deal uh, and how it left uh, <laughs> uh, such a great an impact on you and the rest of your career from that. Uh, so yeah, the next question I would like to ask you is, you have also uh, worked in different uh, sectors and regions from European utilities and infrastructure to head of advisory group in Japan. So which one of these areas have you found the most interesting and what do you think people going into investment banking should know about some of these areas? Yeah, so so I, I think the first point is, is it sort of doesn't matter. Um, but yes, I, I started off as a as a as a generalist M and A banker, um, and that's fundamentally the, the 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 original UK investment bank. So Morgan Grenfell, Warburg, that's what we did. We had a, we were generalist M and A and equity and and sort of an equity advice, and we we there weren't really industry industry groups were starting to come together <clears throat> about halfway. Th through the 90s led by led by the US banks um, and the financial institutions were probably the first industry groups to form so I started off as generalist m a and then I went to, to took a team to Salomon's in 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 uh, 90 uh, 98 to start a UK business for Salomon brothers what they became, became Salomon Smith Barney's city group and that was that was that was a country team so I was then um, had a more general coverage responsibility across the broad, the, a broader product set ba based around the UK. Um, I, I went to, to Tokyo to, to help build the advisory, or to build the advisory business for Nikkei Citigroup. Uh, City had just acquired a, a taken over a joint venture with, with Nikkei, which was one of the leading equity houses in Japan. So an incredibly strong institutionalized equity franchise, which we wanted to translate into, a, into an M&A franchise. And we built uh, the M&A factory. So by the time I left, we were number one in M&A in Japan the year I left. Um, so that was fascinating because that was back to M&A. But how do you how do you build on very strong client relationships to 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 drive uh, a slightly different product set? And it, and, it, and it was both working with the clients in Japan and the teams in Japan, um, which was you know complicated in itself. Because obviously I, I I didn't speak Japanese, so I was one step removed from my clients i was very much relying on on, on other people and that meant that uh, you, you you had to trust you know it was real it was a, it was a fantastic lesson in trust because you had to have implicit trust with the people you were working with because fundamentally you 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 were relying on their interpretation of their clients to help drive the nuance of what you were doing and then the other thing you had to do is you had to motivate the network because you know the industry groups in the U.S. had a thousand things to do with their time, and you know number four hundred and ninety-seven was cover the client in Tokyo, but you had to get I had to change that from one ninety-seven to you know to their priority list to three, so that they would actually think it was really relevant to be driving putting content into my clients in in, in Japan, and and that was again and you couldn't insist on that you had to identify why it was the right thing internally as well as you would the right thing externally. So that whole piece of, of, of unlocking a, a, a broad institution and how do you work with your colleagues, not because they have to, because they want to work with your clients. And then that, if because they want to, then it happens. If they have to, they do, you know, by the book. And that's, so that was, that was fascinating. I came back to, 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 to look and to run an industry group. Again, I hadn't done that before. Um, the utilities team at, at, at City in, in Europe had just decamped en masse to, uh, to a boutique to form the lexicon uh, um, and they, they, they left a big gap and I came back to rebuild that, rebuild the team so it was really a build that I was after but again learning them to focus in on a, on a sector and I went through ended up you know kind of the global infrastructure utilities as well and then back to to, to to when Barclays approached me and a friend of mine, Mark Warham, in in you know in 09 to build the um, M and A business for Barclays in, in Amir, that was a fascinating project where we had to go in and literally we were hired 120 odd M and A bankers 
over a period of a couple of years. It was a complete build, but we had to create, it was, we were building on an existing platform and a very, very strong debt capital markets platform, very strong um, interest rate FX. So, so a huge revenue base and we had to create something that, again, that was relevant. So there's no point in coming in and saying, you know, being, you know, m and it's here, you know, you can relax because in a, in a, in a best world in the world, our revenues were going to be tiny compared to what we were coming into. So we had to create relevance. We had to drive advisory in its broadest sense, advisory across the capital structure. How do you get a deal done? Well, that's just as much about the financing and, and hedging the FX. You know, you think of the volatility in, in interest rates over the last few years, you, you, you could have t- 10% or, or indeed in, in, ex- in foreign exchange, you could have spent a month negotiating the last 10% in an M&A deal and lose that overnight on a, on a movement in FX unless you would also managing the foreign exchange at the same time. So we could build a, we built an advisory practice that was relevant to the organization we were in. And Mark and I, you know, had, it was tremendous fun. That was huge amount of work. It was literally, there was a guy called Sam Dean coming to direct capital markets and it was Sam and us. And we were sort of sitting on the floor, big empty space, rather like it is today, actually looking out on the floor. <laughs> There's no one out there at all, <laughs> given where we are under the current environment. But, um, you were there and it was answering the phone and then building a team around you. Now it's fascinating. So, but the long and the short of it is, it doesn't really matter which one you go into. Um, the most important thing is that you work with people you get on with because this is a tough old industry. And as you know, as a junior, you're working very long hours. You're still, you know, it's, it's still one that's reasonably all consuming for me, 30, whatever it is, years later. And, uh, if you don't, it's hard enough as it is. It's impossible if you don't like the, if you if you don't like the people you're working with. So you've got to. You, the most important thing is you guys go out and think about, start looking at looking at internships and look, looking at, at at careers. Is you know there's a lot of really good firms. Which one do I feel comfortable in? Which one reflects my values? Which one, frankly, do I like the people I meet? That's not a bad test. Because and, uh, it, 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 oh, sorry, carry on. Uh, no, no, I, cool. I, oh, no, I was just, just going to ask a follow-up question on, on that just specific bit where you talk about the culture and values of the firm. And it was really just about, as you've worked at numerous banks from Barclays and City, what was it that drew you to BNP uh, Paribas making that shift uh, mm-hmm. later on? Um, okay, so, so I had, um, I'd spent eight, eight nine, nine years at Barclays um, and the build project was sort of over. We had done the build, and and I'd sort of concluded that there were really no more build projects left in European investment banking. And I was retired, and um, thinking that probably that that was it for me in banking. I'd really enjoyed the build projects I'd been involved with. It had been a fascinating piece, and I thought I might look at, you know, do I go plural, do no execs, and a lot of my friends are going that direction. Um, and then I was approached by BNP Paribas. Um, with the ask for, in, in their words, building a leading domestic UK bank. Now, three years ago when I started, if you recall, we were in, and you may not, because three years ago for you was a long time ago, um, we were in the midst of, 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 of sort of Brexit, peak Brexit hysteria, I can call it that. And, you know, Fanfan was going over to Frankfurt and saying, we're going to, build the world's largest tower block here and everyone's going to move and it's all going to be fantastic and you know the, the whole rhetoric was it's all over london's going to empty everyone's moving out and and i and i and i was absolutely convinced that that was not the case the the london market is you know second largest financial market in the world there's a huge weight of capital here and there are lots of reasons why we uh, that might change but most of them were within the policies of the UK, you know, and its interrelationship globally, that, than I think specific changes on Brexit. Now, undoubtedly, Brexit has had some changes in the finance industry, and um, you know, BNP Paribas is extremely well suited to deal with those because we have a huge weight of business in continent in, in EU27 as well as in the UK. But anyway, at that time, the rhetoric was very much that that the um, you know Brexit was going to be very damaging for, for, for financial markets in the UK. And um, 
it was therefore extremely interesting to me to be slightly counter cyclical that to, to be joining a bank that recognized that the UK and the and the London market was inherently systemically important, irrespective of Brexit, and willing to invest into that at a time when the prevailing um, the, the prevailing sort of orthodoxy was was going the other direction. And so that was a fa that was a wonderful project, and and it had a sideline that it was a UK based role. So I'm I'm running the bank in the UK. I would say not 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 globally, and and that was also hugely attractive. I'd spent my career travelling. I was you know on a plane four days a week, um, when such things were possible, and it was it was very very nice thought to be travelling. I'd do be hopping into a taxi or or getting on a train, and so the combination of those two. Were, were compelling and I put that you know combined with the fact that PMP Paribas you know one of the largest banks in Europe with a clear objective to be the largest bank in Europe very much on the front foot it had been growing steadily and, on, and um, both organically and by acquisition over the previous 10 years domestic bank it believed strongly it needed to be multi multi-local to be to be global um, and the U, as, as part of their growth plan, the UK was sort of next on the list. They'd been in the UK 150 years, but really needed to, wanted to consolidate its position here. And so that that's been very a fascinating time for me to be growing, to be expanding both you know with with people and capital at a time when it, you know I'm, when my peers haven't necessarily been able to do that. That's been very very attractive. And we this was very not like Barclays. We have an incredible platform here. The piece that was missing at, at, at Bimpera was hiring a few people at key pivot points to sort of unlock the potential of, of, of the organization. So hard Andrew McNaught, who's very kindly joined us as, as head of M&A, hard uh, Richard Choi, who joined us as head of real estate advisory, um, started a broking team, corporate broking, to deliver the incredible XAN BNP Paribas, which is our, which is our extraordinary um, equities platform. We have 19 out of the 30 number one analysts in Europe um, to, to deliver that to our corporate clients. We started corporate. So it's been a really interesting, different again. Every bank is different. Um, this is an organization where a lot of people have been here for 20, you know, 25 years. It's, it is, it's an, it, an organization that prizes longevity in the firm. It prizes, it, it, it prizes um, a consensus approach. It's very collaborative. Um, it's it's very thoughtful. It, it, it doesn't rush into things, uh, and all that I find you know I found enormously attractive. So, as I said, I think there are a lot of great firms. You just have to find one where you like the people, and and this is one for me that it was a combination of a of a really exciting growth project and people I could identify with, and that was very compelling. Now, uh, looking back into retrospective. Uh... How has the industry uh, changed over the course of your career, and what do you think that the future holds for uh, investment banking? Um, it's very, it's very. So look, M and M and A is interesting because fundamentally, it's about building trust with your client and delivering good advice against that, and that re that core hasn't changed at all. So whether that was what was happening, you know, curiously, my my my. Uh, father set up a tiny two-person with my his with my elder brother uh, m a boutique in 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 the 60s um or whether it was um didn't last very long um wouldn't recommend father and son combination working in them <laughs> you have to be very patient with your dad in those circumstances my brother wasn't um so whether it is where whether it was then or when i started in the late 80s or now the constant is it's building trust with a client it is um it, it is simple you know it, it's, it's providing independent high quality advice that is uh, you're as willing to tell someone when not to do something as when to do it and that piece hasn't changed obviously what has changed in the interim is that i started and and you would be typing letters and um, we didn't have a computer on every desk and you, you, you originally were doing, you know, I still have my HP 12C, which I did, did my with discounted cash flows on. So your modeling with the, the financial analysis was, was rudimentary compared to, and then we got Lotus and then the models got bigger. Um, and 
then you you know you, we, we but you still had a room you went into that that had hanging files with the accounts for each of, of, of companies and, and news clippings for the you know printed out news clippings and if someone had to file out and hadn't left a car behind you couldn't find you'd have to run on this desk to find you know not a lot of information then you had a limitless information and then the issue became how do you part, pass through all that information a huge amount of analysis great big fat books and actually, I think we're coming out the other side of that now, because more and more of that, I suspect, going forward will be automated. So from juniors then producing <clears throat> and since I, you know, AI is much more efficient at collating all that information, looking through it, finding. So, so I suspect we'll move to a point where a lot of that piece that's taken up a lot of junior time will then get automated. Um, and you'll be back to the bit that I think is really interesting, which is using, looking at trying to find the, the identify the wood, you know, out of the tree. It's, it's not get caught in the trees, set back, look at the patterns, see what's important uh, and give advice on the back of it. Um, so I'm sure there will be a lot of te technical advances in terms of how we process data, how we therefore an analyze companies. Um, but for me, the essence of what we provide as an M&A banker doesn't change against that. Uh, as an industry, you know, we've seen a lot of changes on, 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 on how capital is distributed, the equity capital markets has emerged in my time from a, from a hand book, a hand uh, collated to the sort of full book build through to, you know, and that's gonna, I'm sure will evolve further. Um, but, the basic role of a bank, whether it's 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 it is provided as an intermediary, um, bridging from 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 the from the debt markets to the to the to the capital markets, whether it is this advice piece, I, you know, I see a lot of opportunity for us in that, um, even if the details change. And lastly, uh, I would like to ask you, what advice would you have for younger people looking to go into the M&A industry and what can they expect from it? Okay, so first of all, first thing as I tell every time I go and, you know, I just go and speak at a school, particularly my children's school, they'd, be, they'd always hide their heads at one point because the first thing I'd say is I'd look around and I'd look at people's shoes and I'd point at, uh, if you haven't got polished shoes, I'd say, you're, you're never going to get a job. It, so. Appearances matter because this is a people business and you will get judged irrespective of off on, on not, not because of anything else that I think it's people subconsciously, they want, they're, they're turning to you for advice. They're turning to their, so, you know, I, I'm here in a suit and tie. I wear, it's very old fashioned, but I think clients are, are subconsciously looking to be able, they want to feel that it's a, there's a constant and they can rely on, on people. So that, that attention to detail, whether it's polish shoes or whether it's the typo in your CV, critically important. Attention to detail. m and bankers are obsessively focused on attention to detail because a slip up in a contract can have huge consequences. So people are obsessively focused on attention to detail and that will come through. So that's a little aside. Um, what can I say? It's really about common sense. You, everyone you're with on your course or by definition, they're, they're all very bright, right? Whatever, you, if you're at UCL, you're already, the bar is pretty high, all your peers are bright. Um, so, and, and so it would be when you get into, into it, 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 if you, when you get into banking, is that your peers are all super bright. They've always been first in the class and everything. Um, but there's still, there's still, you know, you can still distinguish yourself in that. And a lot of it is, is common sense. It's the ability, to step back and go does this really does this this really look right the model's throwing this out but <clears throat> and you're not necessarily have to tell the answer you just have to be able to ask the question is uh, you know a confidence to ask questions is the other thing when you start ask lots of questions because it's way better that you ask the question than you labor along forever not quite clear what you're supposed to be doing and then in the end when someone's expecting the answer they're getting out well I wasn't quite sure ask the questions early on so ask questions apply common sense and 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 I guess the last bit is read the room whether it's internally or externally read the room look at people it's all about people 
And, and you don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have, no one needs to be anything, you know, there's room in this industry for all sorts of people um, because our clients are all sorts of people. And you, you just want to be able to, to, you know, to have empathy and connect and, and see what they're thinking. And if you're going down the wrong track and this is clearly not what, you know, change your, change your approach. I, you see too many people who are, they, they've done the numbers, they've got the presentation, and they're going to do it irrespective or not whether the, the client is looking horrified or bored or, you know, know, know how to check, read the room. There you go. Yeah, that's perfect. And I think that wraps us up for all the questions which we had. And I'd like to just say a massive thank you uh, for, to you for coming in today and giving us your time to uh, share your insights about your career and the industry. Uh, it really means a lot to us. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the viewers watching this video in the future will greatly benefit from it. Uh, so yeah, that's all from us. Thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all. Thank you guys very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me and uh, all the very best to you and your colleagues. And we look forward to, uh, look forward to being across the table with you negotiating at some point in the future. 100%, thank you very much. Okay, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.